type of things that can help neurotransmitters out if you simply are depleted are pretty straightforward, like vitamin B12 complex, adequate intake of amino acids, taking digestive enzymes when you consume protein so you unlock even more amino acids which will serve as the precursors for neurotransmitters, consuming foods like uh, olive oil and dosahexaenoic acid from fish, two of the things that kind of line the myelin sheaths that allow neurons to communicate with each other and for the neurotransmitters signal that they're propagating to actually travel through the body. Um, and then on the flip side, if you actually have a pretty significant genetic tendency towards certain neurotransmitter imbalances, well, in that case, whatever, maybe you're dopamine deficient and you would be somebody who would benefit from like Macuna pruriens or other dopamine pre precursors, or maybe you're, you're dopamine dominant and there are certain methylation precursors that you might need like SAMe or trimethylglycine, etc. Welcome to the Mind Health 360 show. I'm Kirkland Newman, and if you, your loved ones, or clients suffer from mental health issues such as depression, anxiety, insomnia, poor memory, poor attention, mood swings, exhaustion, etc., I interview the leading integrative mental health practitioners from around the world to help you understand the root causes of these symptoms, many of which may surprise you and suggest solutions to help you heal. If you like this interview, please do subscribe and forward to others who might find it helpful. If you want further information, please go to www.mindhealth360.com or find us on social media. Hi, so Ben Yo. Greenfield, <laughs> the hero of biohacking. Welcome to the Mind Health 360 show. I'm so thrilled to have you here. You are so many people's hero. What I've been wanting to talk to you about for a long time is your mental health hacks, because obviously yeah. Mind Health 360, we work a lot about you know mental health, neurological health, both for adolescents, kids, adults. Yeah. Now, just to introduce Ben for those who need it, because most people know who you are, but just an overview. So a very short summary, and Ben has done a hell of a lot of things, but a very short overview is he's a health consultant, a speaker, a New York Times bestselling author of a wide variety of books, including the widely popular Beyond Training, Boundless, which is this book, which is literally yeah. like an encyclopedia. Yeah, yeah, it's an encyclopedia of biohacking, wellness, longevity. It's incredible. Fit Soul, Spiritual Disciplines, The Boundless Cookbook, and his most recent Boundless Parenting and Endure. I think you've written 13 titles, if I'm not mistaken. I kind of don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what counts as a book, and I also don't know. I've been writing books since I was like five years old, so... I guess if you count the ones about princesses and dragons and fairies, maybe maybe a couple more. <laughs> maybe a couple more. But anyway, Ben is amazing. He's also a former collegiate tennis, water polo, and volleyball player. He's a bodybuilder. He's a 13-time Ironman triathlete, a professional obstacle course racer, and he's been voted by the NSCA as America's top personal trainer and by greatest is one of the top 100 most influential people in health and fitness. So, you know, you can read about Ben in the show notes. He is just incredible and knows so much. So I'm thrilled to yeah, have you cool. here. So the first chapter of this book, which is the one we're going to focus on, Boundless, you, you start with the brain, essentially. And just to quote you, you say, to begin your journey to becoming boundless, you must first reboot the communication between your nervous system and your body. If your brain can't talk to your body, then you've got an issue that drastically affects your emotions, your intellect, your motivation, your drive, your cravings, your focus and ultimately your ability to feel wholly human and tap into your own boundless life force. Now, I love that quote because essentially it really puts everything at the basis of the mind-body connection. Then you start talking about neurotransmitters and the importance mm. of neurotransmitters because they determine everything, your mood, your anxiety, your you know motivation, all these things. Yeah. And you talk about the fact that people have so many deficiencies or excesses in these neurotransmitters that cause depression, anxiety, demotivation, brain fog, yeah. insomnia, okay. eating disorders, lack of attention, poor memory, addiction, fatigue. We know also that now we're in a real mental health crisis. There's an epidemic of mental health issues, especially among teens yeah. and also adults. And so what I love about your book is you have so much information on how to hack the brain and how to hack your, your mood and your mental health so that you are just you know, much happier, much healthier, much more motivated. So 
Tell me, I mean, okay. it's a tricky one. Okay. Uh, where to start? Like if you want to balance your neurotransmitters, for instance, and is that where you would start when it comes to brain health? Where I would start would be not necessarily with neurotransmitters because I'm very data driven in my approach. Like if you were to come to me and want me to like help you with your diet or figure out something that's going wrong with you, I want to look at your uh, parasites, yeast, fungus, everything you'd find out in a gut stool sample. I'd want to see your DNA so I can see what you are and are not genetically predisposed to from histamine intolerance to methylation issues to nitric oxide production, you name it. I would want to know uh, your, your hormones, typically via urinary hormone tests. I'd want to know thyroid, lipid panel, complete blood count, vitamin D, magnesium, all your electrolytes via a micronutrient and also a blood panel. I'd even want to know things like you know food allergy tests, you know, heart rate variability measurements, sleep measurements. And yes, I'd want to know about your neurotransmitters, but that's not necessarily where I'd start if I have access to data. If I don't have access to data and somebody is complaining about brain fog or poor word recall or lack of verbal fluency or executive function or anything like that, I'd definitely take into account that that's a possibility. Because like you were describing earlier, your brain is the master controller typically is something that early on in the process of dialing in your health you want to take a look at and a lot of people don't right they want to look at their biceps or like you know how fast they can run a 5k or whatever so with the neurotransmitters it's difficult because urinary levels of neurotransmitters don't necessarily indicate the tissue levels of neurotransmitters and a lot of people might think, oh, that's stupid. Like, why, why would anybody ever test neurotransmitters and tell me that my neurotransmitters are imbalanced or low if the urinary test doesn't indicate what's in the brain? Well, if that's stupid, imagine what's going on in lipidology, where basically every single person who's getting a cholesterol test, all they're getting is a test of plasma blood levels of lipids and not the actual tissue levels of cholesterol. So it's not uncommon in medicine to kind of like shoot in the dark and get an approximation for what might be going on, but isn't necessarily going on, which is why urinary neurotransmitter testing is often not even as good as just like a, a profile of mood state score and a questionnaire. Like I talk in the book about this one doctor, he's kind of controversial because he's caught some flack for poor medical practices, but his, his theories behind neurotransmitters are pretty sound. His name is Dr. Eric Braverman, mm -hmm. and he has a quiz that you fill out about you know how irritable you are, how stable you are, uh, how driven you are, how prone to addiction you are, just a whole list of, gosh, I think it's a few dozen questions they answer. And then it gives you uh, a readout of whether you might be acetylcholine dominant or dopamine dominant or serotonin dominant or have certain imbalances in these chemical messengers that help to propagate signals through the body and also dictate things like emotions, mental health, et cetera. So I, I feel like the questionnaire is a pretty decent way to at least wrap your head around what might be going on. There are also uh, genetic tests, like I mentioned, that can tell you how quickly you might break down dopamine, meaning if you break down dopamine super quickly, you might be prone to being that person who just like constantly needs some new rush because dopamine just needs to be in your system a lot. So you're like one of those cliff jumping, skydiving, motorcycle riding superheroes. Or maybe you have poor dopamine clearance and you actually start with like depression and, and, you, know, and then you, you have a hard time feeling good on anything. And, you know, the same could be said of serotonin or acetylcholine, which is typically associated with, you know, in the case of the former, sometimes gut issues, sometimes uh, personality issues related to interaction with other people, acetylcholine, sometimes brain fog, uh, word recall, the type of things we might take um, you know, supplements for that have choline in them, etc. So long answer to your question, but you asked me if the neurotransmitters would be where I'd start. And I'd say if you're showing symptoms that are similar to the type of things that I talk about in the book, that you mentioned that indicate there could be something going on with neurotransmitters, then yeah. And the cool thing is the type of things that can help neurotransmitters out if you simply are depleted are pretty straightforward, like vitamin B12 complex, adequate intake of amino acids, taking digestive enzymes when you consume protein so you unlock even more amino acids, which will serve as the precursors for neurotransmitters, consuming foods like uh, olive oil, and dosahexanoic acid from fish, two of the things that kind of line the myelin sheaths that allow neurons to communicate with each other and for the neurotransmitters signal that they're propagating to actually travel through the body. Um, 
And then on the flip side, if you actually have a pretty significant genetic tendency towards certain neurotransmitter imbalances, well, in that case, whatever, maybe you're dopamine deficient and you would be somebody who would benefit from like macuna pruriens or other dopamine pre precursors, or maybe you're, you're dopamine dominant and there are certain methylation precursors that you might need like SAMe or trimethylglycine, et cetera. So it really takes, you know, as you can imagine from my belabored TED talk of a response, that there does take a little bit of digging and self-education to really truly understand what's going on with neurotransmitters, but painting with a broad brush have olive oil, have fish oil, make sure you get an adequate vitamin B and get amino acids and protein into your body and you're at least gonna cover some of your bases. So that's a great answer. And when you talk about neurotransmitters, it reminds me of hormones as well. Like hormone levels fluctuate from minute to minute. They, they're very yeah. hard to measure yeah. and they're very linked to neurotransmitters, yeah. right? And probably a lot of the same things that affect your hormones affect your neurotransmitters. So that's there's yeah. that sort of link. Yeah. What do you do though if you're a vegan or you're a vegetarian? Because, you know, or if you have like low stomach acid and you can't digest, you know, you can't get the right protein into your body. What would you advise? Because there's so many people who are vegan or vegetarian yeah. Yeah. and there is in fact a phenomenon for instance with um, adolescent young girls who are vegetarian or, or vegan and who suffer from eating disorders and mm. we know that body dysmorphia is very linked to low serotonin for instance and mm. so you know I always it, it's always really difficult because morally you want to be vegetarian but then for your mental health it's it's very challenging to mm. get the right neurotransmitters and the right hormones based you know on a lack of amino acids and protein so what would be your solution for that for vegans and vegetarians or mm. for low stomach acid or <laughs> both. both oh <laughs> well uh, for vegans and vegetarians I mean it's not it's not as hard as a lot of like carnivore and paleo enthusiasts or whatever would have you to believe to get adequate protein from plants, mm -hmm. right? And, and I have nothing against getting adequate protein from plants and eating only plants. The problem is that plants don't have teeth and hooves and claws and all over the defense mechanisms that an animal has. So they instead have internal chemicals that help to protect them that typically will cause the mammal that eats the plant to experience some type of gastric distress or to allow the seeds or the fruits of the plant to go undigested through the digestive tract and be pooped out somewhere else to grow as like an evolutionary survival tactic. Um, or in some cases to simply keep a plant or, or, or a plant species or group of plants from being excessively consumed by animals so that they might go extinct. So because of that, these type of compounds, many of which you're probably familiar with, like lectins and phytic gluten, acid, and phytic acid yeah, yeah, and, and uh, saponins and all these these irritants, particularly to the human gut, must be disabled or deactivated somehow. Not completely, because there's actually some evidence that like trace amounts of gluten, the spices and you know spicy capsaicin-like compounds that we find in herbs and spices, you know black pepper, etc. A lot of this stuff is mildly irritating to the gut, but actually induces what's called a hormetic response, mm. meaning it can induce cellular resilience and cause the gut to become a little stronger or the cell to become a little stronger. But I mean, if you're vegan or vegetarian, you're doing you know, freaking like boatloads of bread and quinoa and grains and soy and uh, you know, a lot of these, even like goitrogenic foods like kale and broccoli and cauliflower and cruciferous vegetables. Yeah, your gut's gonna kind of like take a little bit of a hit unless you are doing things like soaking and sprouting and fermenting and even like combining different grains and grasses and seeds and nuts to make sure that you get the proper protein combinations. And the fact is most vegans and vegetarians, not to stereotype too much, they tend to like to just eat stuff out of packages and straight from the grocery store and out of these fancy overpriced labeled stuff from Whole Foods or whatever and they don't develop like this intimate slow food relationship with their food. So A, getting adequate protein from plants gives you gut distress, and B, you don't get all the proteins unlocked that you would be getting if you'd done things like soaking and sprouting and fermenting and you know you take your oatmeal and you have overnight oatmeal and you take your quinoa and soak that in vinegar and rinse it and soak it again and again to get the soaps off of it, or you take your bread and you have a sourdough you know, fermented bread rather than regular bread and you soak your beans and you use a pressure cooker and it can be a little bit exhausting unless you're just filthy rich and have a personal chef who does all this for you. So 
my message to those who want to eat a plant-based diet is a if you have the luxury of time like soak sprout ferment slow prep a lot of this stuff if you don't a be willing to put up with the gut distress that long term is one thing that causes a lot of people to not want to eat a plant-based diet and then b supplement with like protein powders and amino acids and the type of things that your body's going to need because you're not getting them from plants like collagen. and then if, yeah like collagen and essential amino acids gelatin sometimes depending on whether or not somebody's cool with that from an animal standpoint the other thing is like with the stomach acid it's it's a good point that you bring up because if you don't have enough stomach acid, and usually in a scenario like that, you're also not producing enough enzymes, like pancreatic enzymes, you can eat all the protein you want, but it doesn't get broken down and turned into its bioavailable amino acids very well. And that becomes a problem, especially as one ages, it becomes a problem with excess stress, it becomes a problem with nicotine use or other things that can aggravate the esophageal tract. It becomes a problem with inadequate probiotic or fermented food intake because you get an imbalance of bacteria in the gastrointestinal tract that can limit stomach acid production. And like I mentioned already once, like with the age thing, it you just lose the ability to digest much food as you age. So things like taking probiotics, taking digestive enzymes, especially when you have protein, avoiding things that would irritate the, the gastrointestinal lining or the esophageal tract, including like spicy foods, ultra hot foods, super duper minty foods, uh, nicotine, things like that, even smoking, vaping, etc., that can aggravate the lining and cause stomach acid disruption. There are also, in addition to digestive enzymes that you could take with a meal, other supplements that have like hydrochloric acid in them, like mm -hmm. betaine HCL, or gallbladder in them like ox bile extract. And if you look at a well-formulated digestive enzyme supplement, like in the US there's one company called Thorn, they make one called Biogest that's pretty good. It's gonna have a lot of that stuff in it, but then there are other times when you just have to combine stuff, like get a digestive enzyme and then get something that increases bile flow, like there's something called Tudka that's really good in addition to ox bile and then get a probiotic and just make yourself a little digestive pack. But if you're like me, you just like keeping a little Ziploc bag you know, in your pocket or in your fanny pack or whatever, and you just like eat that before meals, particularly protein rich meals. So do you take digestive enzymes and probiotics at every meal, you personally? No, no. I take a little bit of them with lunch because I have like a light salad for lunch. I have a smoothie for breakfast and I just feel like a smoothie is so easy to digest and mm -hmm. it's just like, you know, added up over the course of the month, I'd probably have like 150 bucks extra of like enzymes and probiotics and supplements if I also had them like 30 times yeah. every time I had breakfast. So I don't have them with breakfast. And then dinner, absolutely, because dinner is usually the most widely varied meal that I eat and, and also has just more protein and more weird foods. And I definitely want to have it with dinner. Yeah. The better you digest food with, with the more you, the, that you eat from dinner, the better you're going to sleep later on too. Yeah. So and the more, yeah, totally. Yeah. And the more nutrients yeah. you'll absorb, etc. Yeah. And you mentioned the sort of gut lining, and that brings me to you have a whole chapter sort of on the blood-brain barrier. And I'm fascinated by the link between your gut lining and your gut permeability and your yeah. blood-brain membrane, which essentially you know allows the good stuff in and is supposed to keep the bad stuff out, both in your gut and in your brain. Yeah. But it doesn't always work that way. And you know, if you get breaches and permeability in both linings, then you know you can have chronic inflammation and you can have toxins go to your brain and uh, and you know get into your system and things like LPS and lipopolysaccharides, etc. And so I'm fascinated by the fact that you spent so long talking about this blood-brain barrier and I think that's so important because I think too few people really understand it or talk about it and so tell us how do you first of all what disrupts the blood-brain barrier and is it the same things that disrupt your your gut barrier essentially your intestinal barrier and also how do you fix it yeah it is in many cases a lot of the things that you would assume would not be that great for the lining of the gut when we're talking about the same things that would cause disruption of the blood-brain barrier. So alcohol, excessive amounts of caffeine, 
Water's great for the blood-brain barrier. <laughs> um, even though, interestingly, the polyphenols and flavanols that you get from tea and coffee in low amounts are good for the blood-brain barrier. That's why I say excessive amounts of caffeine. Coffee's not bad for your blood-brain barrier, but a lot of it, or like way too much black tea or energy drinks or something like that well, would be. That I found extraordinary, that because there's so much controversy around coffee. Like some people say it's great for your brain and it's good for Alzheimer's yeah. and cognitive issues, yeah. and then other people say no. I suppose part it's of it depends. Is all called the media is stupid the dose is yeah. the poison and they'll go come with some study where they give people like a thousand milligrams of caffeine a day and find out that it's not that great for your nervous system or your blood brain barrier or whatever or they'll come out with a study on alcohol where they'll say well even if you drink as little as one drink a day it's bad for you but they don't mention the fact that they don't really differentiate when they say that between this studies that average out those one drinks per day on one Saturday night. And so, yeah, if I have like seven drinks on a Saturday night, then I'm gonna feel a lot different and probably it's gonna do more damage to my gut or my brain than if I have a small glass of organic wine yeah. every night with dinner. But the problem is like the media just does not interpret studies well. And frankly, a lot of experts don't either. So it gets pretty tricky. But back to the blood brain barrier thing. Yeah, alcohol is not great for the blood brain barrier. Uh, especially anything above low to moderate amounts. Caffeine or coffee or anything that's caffeinated or a central nervous system stimulant, like an energy drink in moderate to high amounts, also not good. Um, mineral deficiencies, particularly magnesium deficiencies, are not good for the blood-brain barrier, and this is why I think a well-formulated magnesium compound is great for the blood-brain barrier. The same can be said of fish oil and turmeric or curcumin. Like Both of those compounds are really good for the blood-brain barrier. Stress is bad for the gut lining and it's bad for the blood-brain barrier, as is lack of sleep, which is yeah. horrific for that. You talked about lipopolysaccharides, which can often be formed via the combination of like a high sugar, high fat diets, um, eating food in a stressed state, having poor bacterial balances in the gut, etc. It's interesting because those may also have the ability to cross the blood-brain barrier. So paying attention to, am I having a lot of vegetable oils, ultra processed foods, eating in a stressed state, even if it's healthy food, right, can affect the lipopolysaccharide formation. Am I eating a wide variety of fermented foods and taking a probiotic or not? So you're, you make a really good point that a lot of the same things you do for the gut, you do for the blood brain barrier. But for me, I think some of the top things to do would be magnesium or just a diet that's very rich in minerals, such as magnesium, even though soil it's not that rich in minerals now, mm -hmm. so I think it's better to just supplement, supplement with magnesium, I do. Uh, and fish oil, or just a high intake of really good cold water fish, like salmon, and herring, and mackerel, and anchovies, and sardines, and like these clean cold water fish. And then um, the, the, uh, the spices, like the curcumin, and the turmeric, and many of those root-based spices, ginger would be another example. Those are also fantastic for the blood brain barrier. And when you say magnesium, are you thinking magnesium threonate, which is a type of magnesium that really is good for the brain and for yeah. your yeah. neurogenesis? Threonate or? and glycinate are both glycinate. pretty good for the brain. Okay. Yeah, even though because magnesium, and you know this, like it's just responsible for so many different enzymatic reactions, reactions in the body. Yeah. Like I, I like supplements like that one magnesium breakthrough. It's got seven different kinds of magnesium in it. Um, I like to kind of like rotate through different magnesium supplements that have blends, but it, for the brain specifically, three and eight and glycinate are pretty good. Okay. Yeah. And then in terms of like repairing this famous blood brain barrier and also your, your gut lining, I mean, you talk about some amazing hacks in your book, one of them being, you know, cold essentially. Cold thermogenesis cold or therapy. cryotherapy, yeah. particularly getting the head cold. Yeah. Cold the head. face dunks, or if you do cryotherapy at some kind of a biohacking facility using the one where your whole head is inside, like your whole body is inside and your head isn't just like popping out the top. Or if you have an like ice bath. Like a chamber, like one of those yeah, cryotherapy yeah, like a chamber, chambers. Like yeah, a hard shell awesome. chamber. Or if you have like an ice bath, make sure that your head goes under, which is really great for the vagus nerve, for the cranial nerves, for the mammalian dive reflex, which is good for stress response and for the blood brain barrier. Uh, if you take a cold shower, let the cold water kind of like hit your head and, and pour over it. Uh, you can even use the ice bucket trick. You know the ice bucket trick? No. You go to a hotel, like fill the <laughs> ice bucket in the hotels that still have the ice buckets with ice and hang that in the shower head. And when you take a shower, like the water goes into the ice and the ice pours over your head, which is actually a really, really cool way to, to take care of your brain. 
that. Just anything cold. Okay. I mean, there's a neurosurgeon in the U.S., Dr. Jack Cruz, who does brain surgery on people, and literally, like, one of the main things he does is keeps their head cold because it's just so fantastic for nervous system repair and recovery. Similar to sleep. You know, sleep is that's just where all your your brain's lymphatic drainage occurs, what it's called, where your body kind of cleans up the brain. It's where learning and memory consolidation and processing of emotions and all sorts of things happen that make it almost like the cleanup crew for the brain, including the blood-brain barrier. So, you know, paying attention to adequate sleep as well as temperature regulation of the head. You know, then you're throwing that in there with magnesium and fish oil and you know, spices and some of those other things I talked about, avoiding caffeine, avoiding alcohol, avoiding stress. And then you pair that with, you know, taking your olive oil and, and more fish oil and your vitamin B complex and uh, the, the precursors for the neurotransmitters like the amino acids. And then you're, you're kind of starting to starting to get the cylinders firing. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. Now, in terms of sleep, because you talk a lot about sleep, and I know that a lot of people who have mental health issues have sleep issues as well. And I mean, I certainly had three years of horrific insomnia, which I just couldn't shake. And it was one of the worst periods of my life because, you know, if you really have insomnia, it's a really tough thing to deal with. What are your hacks for sleep? Oh, <laughs> well, it depends, kind of like the neurotransmitters, why you don't sleep. But really, there's four main things that I would say are the easiest to remember. One is light, getting access to lots of natural sunlight during the day, and then at night, getting exposed to as little overhead modern fluorescent LED bright light screen light as possible by doing things like wearing blue light blocking glasses or replacing the light bulbs in the cans of your master bedroom or master bathroom or sleeping or relaxation areas with like red incandescent bulbs or halogen bulbs or you know bulbs that, that have a lower temperature yeah. and a softer color. Uh, and then of course avoiding screens or at least if you are using screens that have software installed on them like the iOS on the phone, there's different red light producing apps that you can use that suck the blue light out of the screen. On the laptop, there's programs like Iris, for example, mm. that can adjust the temperature of the screen. And if you've gotten the light taken care of, another one is temperature. The temperature is huge. I always, uh, at home, sleep at about 64 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, you know, taking a lukewarm shower or uh, some type of a, a cold soak or something later on in the day to lower the body temperature. Using breathable sheets and breathable comforters, not wearing excess clothing to bed not eating a heavy meal within three hours before bed, not exercising hard within three hours for bed. Like you sleep so much better if your body temperature is cool. And there are even supplements like uh, glycine would be an example yeah. of an amino acid that can naturally lower the body's temperature a little bit for sleep. I would also pay attention to um, your noise levels in the room. Things like earplugs, there are apps like Sleep Space or sleep stream that play ambient noise that kind of like covers up the noise that's in the room. And that can help with like dogs, sirens, you know, anything loud that might be going in the room. And you can even use like wrap around soft headphones if you're a side sleeper, like there's some called soft phones. So your phone's in airplane mode. You're playing something like the white noise or the pink noise, the brown noise, drowning out sound along with earplugs. And a lot of these noises have been studied to actually amplify things like your delta and theta brain waves that can help out with sleep. And then probably the last one a lot of people don't think about is just like, it's really a distress, but allowing your body or your brain to associate the bed or the bedroom with anything except you know, primarily rest and sleep and possibly secondarily sex would be the only things that you'd want your brain to associate the bed with. It's like laptop in bed, uh, you know, stimulating business books by the bedside, um, laying on your hotel room bed to do work rather than using the desk across the room. Anything where your body gets the idea that, oh, hey, I can do work in bed and things other than sleep or sex, that's usually something that gradually trains your body to just not shut off when you get into bed. So I would pay attention to those variables, light, um, temperature, uh, levels of stress, and sound. I think that's fantastic. When you talk about sleep, one of the biggest problems for me was a dysregulation of the HPA axis. So I had postpartum okay. depression and I had, I was put on antidepressants that sort of um, artificially regulated my cortisol levels and my HPA axis. And so I couldn't do it on my own. And so one of the key things, and you have a great section on this in your book, all about the 
balancing the HPA axis and balancing your stress, and you have a ton of hacks around that. So what would be your key um, hacks to really balance the HPA axis, which is you know your hypothalamic, pituitary, adrenal axis? And you have this great section in the book where you talk about adrenal fatigue and how you were wrong about that because you know and, and the whole not just you but a lot of people used to talk about adrenal fatigue and now they talk about HPA axis dysregulation. And one of the key things that we that we find also with the whole. Um, research around trauma that's been coming out for mental health is that mental health issues are very often a, a dysregulation of the nervous system, which essentially is the HPA axis. And so fundamental to good mental health is a regulation and a balancing of the nervous system. And you know we know things like the polyvagal theory, and we know uh, we know that the vagus nerve is super important. We know that the hormones, whether it's cortisol, neurotransmitters like GABA, calming neurotransmitters, you know hormones that lead to, um, for instance, progesterone is linked to GABA, and estrogen is linked to serotonin. We, there's a very important piece around this regulation of the HPA axis. So what? And you have some great sections on it. What would you say are the main hacks for the regulation? the HPA axis and also what dysregulates it because another thing I love about it is that you talk about all the different stressors whether they're physiological or psychological so they could be infections or toxins or things that dysregulate the HPA axis not necessarily just because you've had a fight with your spouse it's also because there are physiological stressors such as molds or toxins that might be activating your limbic system and causing HPA axis dysregulation. So basically, what would you say are the key hacks to regulate and balance your nervous system and sort of rebalance your HPA axis if it's out of balance? A lot of the stuff is kind of like elephant in the room type of stuff, like sleep more in many cases, stress less, and take care of the nervous system from kind of like a Mr. and Mrs. Obvious standpoint. But then if you want to take a deeper dive, uh, I think some of, the, some of the things that you should really pay attention to would be vagal nerve stimulation, cranial nerve stimulation in general, but particularly vagal nerve stimulation, chanting, singing, humming, gargling, yoga, meditation, sauna, cold water, even things like vagal nerve stimulators that can electronically stimulate the vagus nerve. For serious issues, you know, there are even physicians who will do what are called stellate ganglion or vagal nerve blocks where they're literally uh, injecting like an in anti-inflammatory fluid near the vagus nerve, but basically doing as much as you can to care for your vagus nerve and tracking your success of doing so with something called heart rate variability measurements, which allows you to see how well your vagus nerve is doing at controlling the beat to beat variations of your heart, which is indicative of nervous system activity. So I would care for the vagus nerve. When I say the rest of the cranial nerves, I would say a good resource for that would be a gal named Lois Laney back in the States who teaches some different exercises like tongue circles and shoulder shrugs and different humming techniques and alternate nostril breathing techniques to stimulate some of the other cranial nerves. Eye movement desensitization training is something that's very popular now that you're probably familiar with in, in uh, psychiatry and psychological fields as a way of dealing with stress and trauma, et cetera. You know, different movements of the eyes, convergence, divergence, you know, cicadic movements, and that also kind of falls into the category of something that's specifically acting on the cranial nerves. So vagal nerve, uh, cranial nerve, um, there are also, uh, again, if we're going to avoid the obvious stuff like sleep and stress, uh, certain electrical modalities that appear to be very stabilizing for the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, uh, uh, infrared light is one. Uh, anything that kind of treats the body like a battery. Uh, and so another one would be uh, low-level radio frequency therapy, um, pulsed electromagnetic field therapy, or what's called PEMF therapy at specific frequencies for the HPA axis. And uh, another one would be uh, negative ion therapy, like earthing, grounding, negative ion generators, etc. There's even, you, know, you and I were recently at that, that health optimization summit and they had a bunch of biochargers there. And biochargers, I mean, that's an example of a machine that actually has a recipe on it for HPA axis regulation. That recipe uses negative ions, infrared light, PEMF, and radio frequencies. And so those are all examples from an electrical medicine modality of things that would help out with the axis. And then, um, you know, I, th I think that if, if you're looking at the vagus nerve, cranial nerves, and 
the the way that they interact with the HPA axis is you're, you're generally looking at nervous system, mm. but you mentioned hormones, and there's such a deep interplay between HPA axis dysfunction because the pituitary is upstream of so many different hormones, and the adrenal gland is responsible for a lot of neurotransmitter and hormone production as well. So doing things like a urinary test for hormones, which is more accurate than a urinary test for neurotransmitters and seeing what your testosterone is at, where your estrogens are at, where your cortisol is at, you know, the upstream and downstream metabolites of cortisol, which you could find out via something like a Dutch test, what your progesterone is at. And I think that in um, significantly problematic cases, something like bioidentical hormone replacement therapy or natural hormone replacement therapy is a good idea as is avoidance of a lot of the things that might disrupt the endocrine system, right? like excess endurance exercise or exposure to high amounts of non-native electricity like cell phones and Wi-Fi signals and radio frequencies that are stronger in nature like uh, cell phone towers and things like that or 5G. Um, and uh, you know, lifting heavy weights, eating adequate protein, you know, having sex, uh, being with people, getting in sunlight, living a more primal lifestyle, in touch with the earth. Like those are all things that can help with natural hormone production, uh, not being fat phobic, meaning embracing things like Mediterranean fats and good amounts of fat intake to act as precursors for hormones. And then like I mentioned, you know, possibly in some cases, something like hormone replacement therapy. So a lot of stuff that you can do for HPA access. Huge amounts. And one of the things I love about your approach is that you, you know, you're a biohacker, but you also do the basics. And so, you know, you're very big on the basics, like sleep and connection with your family and, you know, being in a community and getting outside and sunlight and not just all the sort of highfalutin, like yeah. biohacks. And I think that's a really important thing to, to bear in mind. Now, just a few other things I really want to touch on, and there's so much to cover, but one of them is diet. So you talk a lot about ketogenic diet for the brain and also fasting. Um, and obviously, so you talk about four diets which are particularly good for the brain, ketogenic, fasting, looking after your gut, and then you have a whole list of sort of supplements that are really good for your brain. Now, in terms of the ketogenic diet, I mean, the research is really great um, in terms of bipolar, schizophrenia, depression, brain fog, cognitive decline, neurodegeneration. So can you explain the mechanism? You explain a little bit in, in your book about why ketogenic is so great, but also it's a really hard thing to do, at least I find, and I think a lot of people struggle with it. So what would be your advice? First of all, why does it work? And second of all, what's your advice for people who are, you know, want the benefits of the ketogenic diet, but are a little bit worried about how to do it properly? The brain can burn as a very stable fuel ketones for energy rather than glucose. A lot of ketogenic advocates will kind of lie and say the brain doesn't need any glucose at all. That's not true. It needs massive amounts of glucose, but it can get a lot of it from breaking down proteins in the body and from trace amounts that you get from food. And if you are consuming a diet that is somewhat low in carbohydrates, or in some cases very low in carbohydrates, uh, which would mostly be in it from a medical management standpoint. Most people don't do well with a diet and very low in carbohydrates, but controlling carbs to a certain extent, like you know, uh, anywhere from like 50 to 200 grams a day, depending on your levels of activity, your body will burn fats. And as a byproduct of burning those fats, it will generate ketones or ketone bodies, which are a very stable source for the brain and less inflammatory for the brain than sugars. As a matter of fact, Alzheimer's and uh, other dementia-like conditions are sometimes called type 3 diabetes because of the presence of, of some plaque formations in the brain that are associated with elevated blood sugar levels. So sugar is not bad for the brain, but high amounts of sugar and more namely rampant blood fl sugar fluctuations throughout the day are bad for the brain. And so initially, you know, there was some research that showed that coconut oil, which helps to generate ketone bodies, was good for the brain. And then later, different companies began to develop like drinkable ketones, ketone salts, ketone esters, all of which will raise blood levels of ketones, whether or not you're eating carbohydrates. And those also seem to show a very, very good effect on controlling things like inflammation in the brain, you know, TBI, concussion, things like that. And so it's essentially a very stable fuel source for the brain whether you get it from drinkable ketone or ketone precursor products, or whether you get it through uh, fasting or carbohydrate restriction. Uh, I think that in some cases doing it more naturally is better unless you're like some kind of like a hyper 
athlete who is using ketone esters for performance or you're going for a really long period of time without eating or you just like want to go on a long airplane ride and not be hungry and you want to burn ketones instead of sugars which is actually a decent idea i, I do that um the the way that you would do it which i partially answered would be by restricting to a certain extent carbohydrate intake not as low as you'll often see researchers say because they're mostly talking about medical management scenarios with people who are like sedentary all day long and quoting values of carbohydrates that would be like 10 to 40 grams which i haven't tried that for a little while and it's like almost impossible if you're like going up and down stairs or walking or lifting weights or anything so outside of that scenario depending on how much you're exercising usually having a lower amount of carbohydrates than most people do like most people have 600 700 or 800 grams of carbohydrates a day mm-hmm. so you're having like 50 to 200 grams of carbohydrates i like to recommend that people if they want to do a better job staying in ketosis that they try to time a lot of those carbohydrates around exercise or cold bathing or with things that help the sugar to wind up in the muscle more quickly like apple cider vinegar or Ceylon cinnamon or some people will take metformin or bitter melon extract or berberine but basically it's controlling 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 blood sugar not eating a lot of carbohydrates and then fats like coconut oil even Mediterranean fats like olive oil and avocado oil and some of the fats that might be less problematic from a potential heart disease standpoint can also be fine for getting into ketosis without you having to put like a stick of butter in your coffee and eat the fat cap off every ribeye steak that you have. So, and and a lot of that's related to genetics and that's kind of a rabbit hole, but some people have a very inflammatory response Mm -hmm. to saturated fats. And if they're going to do a ketogenic diet, I would usually recommend they do it with Mediterranean fats and drinkable ketone esters and not like butter and coconut oil and, you know, fats off the steak and things like that. So in addition to that, because the, HPA axis that we were talking about earlier, the Leydig cells in the testes and hormone production in general does need a certain amount of carbohydrates. I generally recommend people follow something like a cyclic ketogenic diet. If we're not talking about ketosis for medical management reasons reasons for something like uh, epilepsy or seizures or whatever. And so the way that works is, and I do this, you don't eat many carbohydrates the whole day. So like breakfast might be kind of like a, some protein powder in a smoothie with some coconut milk or bone broth, but not like a bunch of bananas and berries and stuff like that. Lunch is maybe a salad with some fish uh, or some nuts and seeds and a lot of olive oil. And then dinner would be the time of day when you have more of the carbohydrates, like sweet potatoes and yams and rice and sourdough bread and maybe a glass of red wine and some dark chocolate or some nice ice cream. and. The cool thing about that is you're kind of training your body to be in fat burning mode all day long, which often translates into ketosis and does the longer that you do it. And then you're getting kind of this surge of carbohydrates at the end of the day that's good for the HPA axis and that also helps you produce more serotonin so you can sleep a little bit better too because that helps with melatonin production. So that's kind of like how you would do it and why you would do it. Yeah, which is great. And then the other thing that you mentioned in your book is also the effect on mitochondria, that apparently it's a, it's a better source of fuel for mitochondria and it creates larger and healthier mitochondria yeah. than glucose, which yeah. I found fascinating. Yeah, ketosis seems to induce some amount of what's called mitochondrial biogenesis right. and proliferation. So. Which yeah, is absolutely. fascinating. And then the other thing that you say in your book, which you know, I'm, I know we're jumping slightly all over the place, but there's so much to say, is you, you make this comment, which I think is, is so interesting. You say, if you were given um, you know, candy floss versus a bag of crisps, you would always take the candy floss. And that really shocked me because you know, everybody vilifies sugar and sugar obviously is terrible. Um, but people don't vilify fried foods and bad fats. I mean, we know they're bad, but there isn't that same sort of, you know, that's a poison. Whereas you're very clear, and you're one of the few people I've heard really bang on about this, is the, the, the damaging effects of fats that are damaged or, or that are, you know, oxidized or that are, um, you know, canola oils and, and bad fats, essentially, trans fats, etc. Uh, etc. And you know, because the brain is 60% fat and the membranes are made of fat, what your point is, which I thought was fascinating, is that you know you can do something if you take sugar, you can like do some jumping jacks or go run and burn it off, but you can't get rid of those bad fats. So 
explain why that's so important and and you know is that really like the good fats are so important for you and the bad fats are terrible compared to sugar why is that so much a thing for you that the that you avoid the bad fats and it's less of a problem with the sugars oh okay yeah i mean fructose particularly as a sugar has gotten kind of a bad rap often being vilified as poison or whatever when the only situation in which fructose has been shown to be harmful for the body in any way or cause like non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or excess you know, triglycerides, which could potentially cause cardiovascular disease or anything like that, is when fructose is consumed in a hypercaloric overfed state. Meaning if I'm burning 2,000 calories a day, theoretically, I could drink like 2,000 calories of Coke a day and I'm fine, like from a metabolic standpoint. Wow. Yeah, I'm going to build up some micronutrient deficiencies and protein deficiencies and whatever, but you could literally just like eat honey all day long. And as long as you're not eating more of it than the number of calories that you're burning, you can throw nearly every fructose and sugar study out the window in terms of what they're saying it does for the metabolic system or heart disease or whatever. Your body's really good at just like burning sugar off. Yes, it wouldn't be that healthy, but it's not as bad as a lot of people would have you to believe or particularly as bad as at least in my opinion, an emerging substance that because of everything from corn and grain subsidization to vilification of saturated fats has become quite commonplace. I was actually at a fancy restaurant like last night and they brought out the bread and as they poured the oil over the bread, the waiter said, and I have here this wonderful um, you know, carafe of rapeseed oil that I'm pouring over your bread, which is basically like canola oil. And um, you know, me and everybody at the table who were kind of uh, up to date on this stuff, we were like, no, 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 no. We'll take olive oil or avocado oil or whatever because, and this is why I would, I would prefer to have sugar versus rancid oxidized fats if I had the choice, like high amounts of sunflower oil or safflower oil or canola oil or vegetable oil or margarine or anything like that because those fats go on to comprise your cell membranes for like, I used to say the next 90 days, but now research seems to show that it's up to nine months that those fats stick around in your body and make up your cells. And they're just so easy to find in everything from like the olive oil that you buy at the grocery store that's been cut with canola oil to most dressings and sauces, unless you're careful and you're reading labels to, you know, even like healthy packaged food in the airport or at the grocery store or whatever, you really got to watch out. It's not impossible. Like I don't eat a lot of vegetable oils, but um, you do have to watch out because they find their way into a lot of things. And yeah, there are certain things you can do to mop up the damage like, you know, spirulina or uh, glycine would be another example, you know, activated charcoal. There are some things you could do if you accidentally, if you somehow accidentally like eat half a pizza or go out for a burger and fries or whatever, but I don't recommend it uh, because of the problem with the vegetable oils in terms of their impact on cardiovascular disease. I mean, even if you look at the country of India, which is developing serious issues with chronic diseases like diabetes and Alzheimer's, if you track the emergence of those diseases with the onset of like higher intake of carbohydrate consumption, there's almost no correlation, but you can track it with the replacement of traditional Indian fats like ghee, for example, or olive oil with vegetable oil, and there's an absolute correlation. And like when I was in India last time, I literally would like tell the waiter or call the chef out to the table and ask them to please prepare this in ghee or olive oil or avocado oil or another healthy fat. You know, we also use things like macadamia nut oil or grass-fed butter at our house because I like to avoid the vegetable oils. So back to the root of your question, and I'm going to assume that candy floss here is what we call cotton candy exactly. in the U.S. Yeah. Using my imagination, if yeah, you were to walk up to me at like the fair and offer me a stick of cotton candy or candy floss or a corn dog or some other fried food, I would totally take the sugary thing because I could just like go run around the fair and do some push-ups or whatever, just like burn the sugar off. But the oils are what is going to be used to comprise my body cells for a really long time really long and time. do a lot more damage than the sugar would do. Okay, a few more questions. Um, detoxification, because we know that there's a huge issue with toxins in your brain, um, which you know go through the blood-brain barrier, cause neuroinflammation, and that leads to neurodegeneration and brain fog and depression, all these things. So the key toxins, heavy metals, molds, um, you know, plastics, pesticides, herbicides, What's your sort of hack around detoxification if you were to give us, I don't know, two or three of your top hacks to make sure that you're, you know, not getting all these toxins in your brain to cause neuroinflammation? Yeah. 
Yeah, your body's largest detoxification organs or, or mechanisms would be your stool, so your bowel movements, uh, your skin, and your breath. And so I am not a fan of just like eating a crappy diet all year long then doing some massive New Year's detox. That's just a bad way to live because your body just has to deal with that all year long and it's difficult on the digestive tract and accumulation of metals and things like that, particularly in the brain, which is relevant to your audience. And uh, it has an impact on, on blood flow and, and excess damage to DNA. And because of all of this, it's better to just live a lifestyle in which you're regularly detoxing. Like you did a sauna session today, you know, it was infrared sauna particularly because those photons of light really penetrate more deeply into the skin and that sweating response occurs, that's fantastic for detoxification. So much so that you should clean your sauna frequently because there's so much metals and stuff lined up in it that you don't want to rebreathe those back in and reabsorb them. Another example would be uh, regular bowel movements by using things like you know bowel softeners such as magnesium, traditional Indian herbs for detoxification like uh, triphala, for example and even looking into things like coffee enemas or colonics, not every day, but you know, on a somewhat regular basis, like monthly or something like that, to actually allow for bowel, to, to, for, for toxins to be removed via the bowel. And because a lot of what winds up in your large intestine and is eliminated rectally is coming from bound up toxins in the liver, typically you want to make sure you're supporting liver detoxification with things like glutathione and N-acetylcysteine and dandelion and milk thistle extract and a lot of compounds that, that are traditional detoxificants for the liver. And so, you know, for example, like once a week I do a deep sweat in the sauna and typically I try to do it three to five times a week. I'm typically taking some kind of a binder like activated charcoal or something like that beforehand, which helps to bind the things that are being processed by my liver. And before I take the binder, I'm taking glutathione or N-acetylcysteine. Sometimes on the same day, I'll even do like a coffee enema, which is fantastic for allowing the gallbladder and the liver to step up their function and for more things to be removed in the bowels. Uh, and breath work, surprisingly, is actually a really good idea for not only just you know, nervous system training and oxygenation of the body and tolerance to carbon dioxide, but it's actually a really great detoxification strategy as well because you do breathe off toxins. And so not only should you pay close attention to air pollution, but you can do things like breath work in the sauna and just regularly engage in some of those detoxification strategies. It's a good idea. The other thing is you have a huge section on smart drugs mm -hmm. um, and, you know, sort of nootropics and smart drugs. And, you know, you talk about the fact that SSRIs and smart drugs such as Ritalin and Adderall, um, can create a sort of dependency and can then create a resistance to sort of natural um, in, endogenous uh, neurotransmitters. And so your preference would be to choose nootropics over those because they can actually regenerate the brain and cause, you know, increased nerve growth factor, BDNF, etc. So what are your favorite nootropics um, to cause sort of neurogenesis? And if you wanted to replace ADHD meds or antidepressants, what would be your go-to nootropics to do that? Kind of goes almost like full circle back to the beginning of our discussion because most nootropics and smart drugs act on specific neurotransmitters. And so what works well for one person may not work well for another and may even aggravate another person. This is why I like companies like uh, there's one called Newtopia where you go to their website and you fill out a questionnaire very similar to that questionnaire I described earlier about how you sleep and how you focus and you know, whether you have insomnia or too much energy or too little energy and they kind of custom formulate blends of different herbs and nootropics and smart drugs that are specific to you. Uh, other examples of like shotgun formulas would be like on it has one called alpha brain or qualia has one called mind or uh, there's another company uh, by um, they, they make one called a uh, siltep I believe and so some of those blends work really well but let's say we're going to step back and like paint with a broad brush something that would work well for just about anybody including something that would kind of like help somebody if they were on Adderall or an SSRI and perhaps wanted something different. I'm not a doctor, I don't want this to be taken as medical advice, but usually something that allows the brain to process a little bit better while also replacing the fuels that the brain would use up while processing is a pretty good idea. So because of that, I would say that a really good stack to start with would be 
um, something called Nupept, N-O-O-P-E-P-T, which is a compound that you'll find in many smart drug or nootropic formulations, uh, and, uh, or a racetam, like paracetam or aniracetam. And you would take those and you would combine them with something that's rich in choline, like alpha-GPC. Um, or uh, cytocholine, or even like a higher intake of walnuts or fish or eggs. So you're kind of pressing down the gas pedals of the brain while simultaneously replacing some of the fuel that the brain is burning through. And if you weren't gonna do like a big shotgun done for you formula or something like the Newtopia products where you're filling out a quiz, something like Nupept and or aniracetam combined with the choline would be a good way to start. And then one final thing before we wrap up, that you make a very beautiful point about the importance of the soul and spirituality and purpose. And you say, you know, uh, and, and this is one of the reasons I think you're, you're so popular as a biopacker is that you're like, you know, we're, none of us are gonna live forever. We're not gonna look like supermodels, you know, when we're 97 or, or sometimes even when we're 20. But the point is, you know, what's really important is what is your purpose in life? And, you know, what is, what are you doing here? And I really like that. And I think, you know, you have a very strong sense of purpose. You have a very strong sense of family. You have a very strong sense of community. Can you tell us a little bit about sort of, you know, how that drives your life and how everything I've read in your book really sort of boils down to that is our yeah. place in our common yeah. humanity. Yeah, um, obviously it's a, it's, a, it's a deep topic. Um, I think of myself and I think that, that people should think of themselves as not a, 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 a body with the soul, but a soul with the body. Like everything that we do, our brains, our flesh, our muscles, our bones, everything eventually is just gonna be gone. We're gonna be old and ugly and wrinkled and buried in the ground. But for better or worse, the one part of us that will go on to live for eternity, that spark inside each of us, you know, like the, I forget the Disney Pixar movie, I think it's actually called Soul or Spark or something like that. That is the part that is the most important to take care of through relationships and through family and through love and through positive emotions and through meditation and prayer and singing and worship and connection to a higher power. And that is the most, at the end of the day, important thing because that really is the eternal you, whereas everything else will fade. Ancient philosophers like Pascal or Augustine, who would say that we have this eternal hole in our souls and we're just gonna keep grasping at a whole bunch of stuff until we find something eternal, like a connection to God to fill that hole. And what happens is like all this stuff, the biohacking and the smart drugs and the, you know, cotton candy and candy floss and corn dogs and everything, like none of that's gonna be fulfilling at the end of the day until you're caring for your soul. And then when you're caring for your soul, all that stuff becomes like the icing on the cake and it's super fulfilling. And so many people just get it backwards. They're like, ah, oh, I'm gonna try, you know, better sex now and you know, pick up a new musical instrument and you know, buy some biohack or you know, get a hyperbaric chamber or switch my diet or whatever. And at the end of the day, like you always lay awake in bed at night thinking there must be something more than this until you begin to care for your soul. So that's long story short as I would say, think of yourself as a soul with a body not a body with a soul and structure your, your day and your life accordingly. Accordingly. You just wrote a book called Boundless Parenting, which, um, and I've met your kids. They are absolutely amazing kids. They're some of the most mature, wise, mm -hmm. adorable kids I think I've ever met. What is your sort of distilled elevator pitch on you know your parenting hack <laughs> on this how to get such yeah. great kids? Uh, <laughs> Love, time, presence. Kids want to be seen, loved, and heard. More is caught than taught, so set a good example. And there's a whole lot more at BoundlessParentingBook.com. Oh. Yeah, fantastic. Yep. Thank you so much, Ben Greenfield. To find Great more questions. about um, about you, where, where should people go? Just BenGreenfieldLife.com. BenGreenfieldLife.com. Ben ben fantastic. Got it. Well, cool. Ben is amazing. Thank you so much. And Thank your you. books are amazing. And Thanks. 
you are like a walking encyclopedia. So it's thanks. been a real pleasure and a well, privilege. Thanks for having me. Thank you cool. so much. Thank you so much for listening to the Mind Health 360 show. I hope that we've helped you realize that mental health symptoms have root causes that can and need to be addressed in order to sustainably heal and have given you some ideas about steps you, your loved ones, or clients may take to start their healing journey. Please share this interview with anyone you think may find it helpful, and don't forget to subscribe to keep up to date with our latest interviews on integrative mental health. If you want further information, please go to www.mindhealth360.com or find us on social media. This information is for educational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose or treat any disease or to replace medical advice. Please always consult your healthcare practitioner before discontinuing any medication or implementing any changes in your diet, lifestyle, or supplement program.